For content like this and more, please visit kingdomnation.org or any of our social media pages. Be blessed. Excited to be sharing uh, the word of God with you today. Um, to the title of today's message, as you can see from people's comments, these things must happen slash the corona effect. Thank you, brother Tapio, for joining us. Uh, so our first reading was John four verse four, the, uh, which which and, and the key the key verse is and Jesus must pass through Samaria. Then we read Matthew sixteen verse twenty one. Now we said, in Jesus must, since Joy just posted it there, uh, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again on the third day. That's the second scripture. And the third scripture is Matthew 24, verse 6. Matthew 24, verse 6. And, and, and it reads, And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be fair mines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Eish. Again, we see the word must in verse 6. We see the word must, because the scripture says there, I think we now have it there, and... and um, and you, and these things must come to pass. So in the first reading, Jesus must go through Samaria. In the second scripture, the scripture we, we read in the book of Matthew 16, and Jesus must pass, go through Jerusalem and suffer many things. And now the scripture is telling us, tell, telling us that these things must happen, come to pass. The title of today's message, as you can see from the scripture readings, these things must happen, slash the corona effect. To those who just joined us, thank you, Sister Linda, for joining us. So excited to welcome you to, to our Sunday service. Thank you for broadcasting. Uh, thank you for tuning into our broadcast. Um, let's, let's, we've just read, to those who just joined us, we read three scriptures. We read from John 4, verse 4. We read from Matthew 16, verse 21. Then we read from Matthew 24, verse 6. And the key word, you know, the three scriptures is the word must. In the first reading in John 4, Jesus must go through Samaria. He ministers to a certain woman, and the Samaritans receive salvation. In the second scripture, Matthew 16, Jesus must go through Jerusalem and must suffer certain things. And then after all these things happen, he must die, and then he must resurrect on the third day. The last scripture we read in Matthew 24, uh, the scripture is telling us that before for the end of the world to come to, to come to pass, there are certain things that must happen, and some of these are wars, and, and some of these are rumors of wars, and kingdom fighting against kingdom, and pestilences, and earthquakes, and famines. All these things must happen, and then the end shall come eventually. Title of today's message: These things must happen. So let's just get in. Let's just get into a time of prayer before you know we, we get into the preaching. Uh, of the message father we thank you for the day we thank you for that everyone is taking that time out to be here to be partaking of your word i pray that even as we've read the scripture we pray that may this be an inspired word in a, in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in a prophetic season in such a time as this may this be that word in jesus name that is going to bring transformation that's going to bring revelation that's going to bring change in all of our lives and may we not just may, it, may the word not just change us but may it empower us to become agents of change so that we will also be able to change our spouses and change our kids and change our atmosphere, change our families, change our communities. May we become agents of change in our nations. We pray that even as we're getting to the part, we've just read your word. We pray for the inspiration. We thank you for your word. And now as I'm going to begin to preach, I pray that, Father, may Farai not speak, but may the man of God speak. We, I pray that may you bind all flesh and may you bind my thinking, my mind, my concept, my views. May you bind me, but may the Spirit be Begin to speak. Holy Spirit, I am your man of God. These are your people. Teach me to speak how you want me to speak. May me, let me help me to say what you want me to say, how you want me to say it. And may it get across in the way you want it to get across. I pray that even as I'm going to be preaching from spirit, may the listeners begin to listen from spirit. May spirit minister unto spirit. And as spirit is ministering unto spirit, may we have spiritual results. We pray for angels to be activated. We pray for the supernatural to be activated. We pray that may blind eyes see, may deaf ears hear. May those that have closed minds begin to be open. May people that have been living for certain breakthroughs, may breakthroughs begin to come. We pray for angels that may angels that have been waiting for assignments, may they begin to receive their assignments even in the middle of the message and then may they begin to be activated and may they begin to move 
and to answer prayers and to begin to address situations, situations that we're dealing with as individuals. Some situations are secret. Some people have secret situations that they're dealing with. May those situations be addressed. Some people, some maybe it's, like it's a couple that are going through certain challenges. May those challenges be addressed. In Jesus' name, in whatever dynamic, in whatever sphere, in whatever situation, may the word address. And may it be like just as Jesus spoke to the centurion and the, the scriptures say that he spoke and when he spoke the word, the person was healed where he was. May the, as the word is being spoken, may miracles happen, may breakthroughs occur, may things begin to happen in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. The title of today's message, like I said, is these things must happen slash the corona effect. Uh, you know, in, in, in my introduction, I just want to share about a couple of policies. You know, I just heard the Holy Spirit say to me, I should share these things with you, you know. You know, there's certain couple policies that we have in our house, you know, that have helped us as a couple to bond closer, to be closer. You know, I thank you, Deaconess, for joining us. <laughs> thank you, Sister Muriel. Thank you, Sister Rumbi. Thank you guys for joining us. You know, there's certain things that, you know, that we've, we've learned over the years as a couple. Um, some of you maybe have been married longer than us. Uh, but in our, in our approximately 10 years of marriage, there are certain things that we've learned, um, you know, through our ups and downs. One of the things that we apply in our marriage is what we call the 24-hour policy. The 24-hour policy. And what the 24-hour policy is, is that it's a rule that we made that, you know what, as a couple, we are not supposed, we don't allow ourselves to refer to things that have happened 24 hours prior, if it's negative. So if something bad happens, if I, do, if, for example, Apostle, you know, makes a mistake 20, like two, three days ago, you know, my wife, Pastor Ru, is not allowed to refer to those negative things. If I do something good, yes, we can refer to it. But if it's negative, the 24-hour policy says, nope, you can't talk about it today. Because you notice that, you know, as a couple, it's easy to get lost. You know, you can, in conversation, you can start with something simple like, can you please pass me the salt? Then next thing, you're talking about something that was done to you five years ago, seven years ago. And, you know, just a simple scenario of pass me the salt can end up with people grabbing each other on the throat. And we notice that one of the reasons is because, you know what, when you spend years together, you, will, you are bound to make mistakes to each other. But if you keep referring to those things, you'll always have cases against each other. You'll always have cases against each other. So, you know, when, when one person begins to say, you know what, but I remember you did this to me, you made this, you made this mistake that day and I was angry and you did this. And then you, then the other spouse would then respond and say, but you did this and then you did that, then you did that. So then we said, hey, okay, let's introduce a policy that if something bad happens, if, if I make a mistake or if you make a mistake, it only has 24 hours lifetime. You know, after 24 hours, no one can refer to it. It's gone. It's past. But if I do something super romantic, two years later, I can still refer to it because it's positive. So, you know, we have, we have the 24-hour policy. And the second policy we have is the trigger. You know, we notice that sometimes, you know, as a couple, there are certain words or there are certain conversations that can trigger certain negative things. You know, there are certain words that may be sensitive to me, you know, and, and if, if, my, if my wife then says, you know, this, 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 and then she, 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 she triggers certain things that will maybe provoke me to get angry. So we said, you know what, let's identify triggers in our marriages. And there are certain things that we've, certain topics that we've identified as triggers and certain words that we've identified as triggers. And there's a couple we've sat down and we said, you know what, let's stay away from triggers. And, you know, if, if she says something that will trigger certain things, I'll say to her, hey, that's a trigger. Stay away from that. That's a no-go area. That's a no, you know, that, don't go there because you're going to trigger things and you don't want to see what you get. You don't want to get that. You don't want to go there. So we've also identified, and you know, if you're a couple, you know, I hope these things are the tools that you can also use in your own marriage. You know, the 24-hour policy, try not to, re, to, to always refer to things that happen, no matter how bad it is, no matter how, how extreme, 24 hours later, you can't talk about it. You can't talk about it. So these are some of the things we share with our couples and we're doing counseling that, hey, you guys need, you may need to try out the 24-hour policy. Don't refer to things after 24 hours. It's expired. And number two, identify triggers in your, in your marriage. Identify triggers in your relationship. Words that, that will make someone, your spouse angry or words that will, that will provoke the other person. Or words that, that, that will end up, you know, getting you guys in the wrong direction. Begin to identify those things. And if you're a couple and you're watching this, sit down with your spouse and begin to address these things. Say, okay, you know, the things that, you know, that happened 24 hours ago, let's take time to just forgive each other. Forgive and forget. And never to refer to again. Amen. And then let's sit down and talk about triggers. You know, what, what words do I say that trigger you to get angry? And what do I do that triggers you to get angry? And then, you know, begin to address that. But there's a third thing that, that is more relevant to this scriptures, to, to today's message that we apply in our house. And, and um, that's the, you know, better idea policy. Better idea policy. So the better idea policy works like this. 
if we're talking about something or, you know, if I have an idea, she's not allowed to criticize my idea if she doesn't have a better option. Or if she has an idea for something, she's not allowed, I'm not allowed to criticize the idea unless I have a better option. And, and even when we're, doing, when, we're, when we're just watching other movies, watching TV or watching the president's speech or just discussing certain issues about life and, and whatever, economics, whatever it is that we, we may be discussing, unless you have a better idea, you're not allowed to be, to be critical, you're not allowed to be judgmental. Because we notice that it's easy to, be, to comment and to just criticize and to judge. But now when it comes to you to say, okay, what do you think? What should be done? What should be done? All of a sudden, you start stuttering. All of a sudden, you don't have a better option. But you're busy criticizing someone who's doing something, but you don't have a better idea. So we then said, you know what? Instead of being that couple, being those people, being that person who's always criticizing, be that person that you criticize when you have a better option. You say, you know what? I don't like that idea because of this, this, and this. But I think that maybe if you try to do it like this and this and this, it will work out. And so those are the things that we are, some of the, 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 key, the keys we apply in our marriage. I hope, I hope, you know, you also apply them in your house. That, you know what, unless if you have a better idea, don't, you know, and this one doesn't just apply to being married, but it just applies in life. Unless you have a better idea, don't be the one to judge. Don't be the one to always criticize. Don't be the one to always downplay what other people are doing. Try to sit down and also think that, what about you? What can you offer? What can you do? So, you know, a couple of weeks ago, you know, we were talking about, about you know, the coronavirus and, and what presidents, what different presidents are responding differently. And so we're discussing about how, you know, presidents are responding. And then my wife was like, you know what, the, president, the South African president is, is doing good, he's doing well. I think he's addressed it, you know, uh, you know, very effectively, you know, he's implemented the lockdown. And other than the lockdown, he's also implemented, you know, the, the testing zones and now he's testing out. I think he's doing a great job. And then I was sitting there, I was like, ah, I don't think so. You know, I think, you know, there are better ways he could have handled it, um, you know. And then, of course, because of the better option policy, I had to come up with a better policy. Then she asked me, then what would you do if you were president? And then, you know, the moment she asked me that, I didn't realize that at that, mo po at that moment, at that time, I didn't have a better idea. I didn't. Then I say to her, you know what, I'm sure the president had enough time to think about it, so give me time to think. <laughs> so that was my card. I was like, okay. I take back my criticism. I take back what the things I've said. Let me also think about if I can come up with a better way. So I, so I began to, to, to ponder on the dynamics of what would I do if I was, if I was the president of, of, a, of a country right now in the middle of the crisis, what would I do? Would I say, you know what, let's lock down? Or would I say, you know what, no lockdown. Let's let, let things go as usual. Or would I say, let's just start off by testing everyone. What would I do? And you know, one of the things as, as, as Christians that we don't do, and even as a person we, 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 we try not to do, is that we don't put ourselves in those positions. We don't put ourselves in positions. And today I want to ask you, if you were the president of whatever country it is that you want to be president of, what would you have done? What would you have done differently? What would you have done that would have been better than what these presidents are doing? What would you have done? You know, a lot of times I've noticed it's easy for us to, to look at those people in positions of power, to look at those people in positions of authority, and to say, you know what, they're making this mistake. And even in a company setting, it's easy to look at the boss and say, you know what, he's making that mistake, he's making that mistake. You know what, there are better ways of doing it. And then we just generalize, you know, there are better ways of ending this situation. You know what, I would have done better. But what is it would you have done? Let's be, let's be real and let's be, let's be genuine to ourselves. What is it that you could have done? I don't know if you have something, if you have a better option. You can even type it, it's fine. <laughs> we'll go through it after service. If you have something that you could have done better than what the presidents are doing. And the more I begin to think about, you know, the, the, the dynamics of the lockdown and, and, and you know, the, the economy, because the main challenge of, of how to respond to the coronavirus is that it was putting presidents and leaders in positions of choosing between life and the economy. Human, human life and money. Because the, whilst the nation needs money, and it's true, the economy needs to be sustainable. The economy needs to continue running. Life is important. And so, you know, they were stuck in that. So when I was thinking about what I would do, I didn't realize that that was the only issue. The issue is life and money. What is more important? Because if you say, you know what, let's, let's take the life route, it's going to cost the nation money. And then if we say, you know what, let's, let's, not, let's not lock down, you know, let's just continue business as usual, whilst the economy will be sustained and make money, lives will be lost. And so I began to realize that, you know what, it's a bit more complicated than it looks. It's, more, it's complicated. It's because it's things are connected. And as I was pondering on what I would, as a president, you know, what I would you know, prescribe and what I would do, which policy I would implement in a situation of a crisis like this, I began to remember um, the wise words of Barack Obama when he was being interviewed 
on one of these shows and then they asked them, you know, as a president, you know, what would you say was the greatest challenge you've experienced? As your president in your first term, what was the greatest challenge? You know, and then he, he in his response, he says, the thing that I've learned in my first term as president, in my first year as president is that the higher you go up in position and in rank, the more you begin to realize that things are connected. And there is no clear right answer and no clear wrong answer. There's no clear right solution and no clear wrong solution. Things are not as black and white as they seem from the ground. And then he said that in his first time as president, he, he, he learned that and when you're a president and you're making and you're confronted with a situation and you make a decision, every decision you make as a president, it will be right to certain people, but it will be wrong to certain people. It will benefit one group of people, but it will also cost another group of people. And then he says that then the backlash you get from people is that people will begin to say to you, but Mr. President, you know, do you know that this, this decision you've made is affecting us this way? Do you know the decision you've made, you know, it might be good to this group of people, but it's costing these people. Do you know this decision that you're making, it's right for these people, but it's wrong to these people. And then he began to say, that's the challenge that you, you encounter, as a, that I've been encountering as a president. And then I began to apply that to this situation that I began to realize that this is one of those situations that Barack was referring to. Situations in which, you know, the decision you're making is right in one area, but it's wrong in one area. It will benefit one area and it will cost another area. And, you know, and then I begin to say, you know what, it's, 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 um, it's, I don't know if you'd want to be president in these times. <laughs> because you're either going to be remembered, if you were the president, and then you make a decision, either you're going to be remembered as the president, you know, who chose life, and then you cost the company, your currency lost value, you know, people lost jobs, companies were closed, all sorts of things happened in the financial sector, but lives were, 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 were you know, lives were saved. Oh, you're going to be the president who you saved the economy, you thrived, the economy was thriving, businesses were running, people were getting, going to their jobs, but also lives were lost. And you know, at the end of the day, when you look back, 12 months from now, even in December, when you look back and we reflect on, on 2020, we are going to remember these leaders based on those things. But if you were the president in, that shoe, in their shoes and in that situation, in the thick of things, you'd understand that it's not as easy as good and bad and right and as wrong. It's not as easy as that. It's not clear cut. It's complicated because things have a way of being connected. And then I began to talk about, you know, the, and then I began to think about the limitations of just being a human being. Because, you know, the thing that the frustrations we have as human beings is that we, we are a limited commodity. We are limited. We are limited. Now, the three things that, are, that were limited in that I share off in, in, in the book, uh, Hungry for Greatness, if you don't have a copy, you need to buy a copy. There, there are certain limitations, you know, that I began to think about. And I was just thinking, this is all me thinking about, you know, what I would do as president regarding the coronavirus. And I began to think, think about the, the limitations about being a human, human being. There are three limitations we have as human beings. Number one, we, we were limited in time. And number two, we're limited in space. And number three, we're limited in resources. These are limitations, brothers and sisters, that affect us whether we like it or not as human beings. You know, limited in time. How does that mean? That means that, you know, you only have 24 hours a day. You have 24 hours a day. You have seven days a week. You have 365 days approximately in, in, in a year. And you have one lifetime. You have one lifetime. You have a single lifetime. And so you have limited time. And sometimes you want the things that you want to do, but you only have 24 hours to do those things. But now, because you only have 24 hours, there are certain things you can't do. And in those 24 hours, maybe you only have maybe 8 hours of productive hours, maybe 8 or 10 hours of that, are, that are considered as productive hours. From, from 8 a.m. in the morning, maybe to 5 p.m. When, when businesses are running, that's, those are the hours you're supposed to be productive. So we have limited time. And so once, even though there's so much we want to do, the reality is that as leaders, there are certain restrictions and limitations they have. And even as human beings at an individual level, there are certain limitations we have. We have limited time. We have limited time. We have 24 hours. But sometimes there are things we want to do that need more than 24 hours. Number two, we have limited space. Limited space. We are spatial beings. What that means is that as human beings, we can only be at one place at a time. So you're either watching this broadcast, or you maybe you're watching TV, or maybe you're working. And so we thank God for you taking the time out to be here because you're a special being. You can only be one place at a time. That's one of the limitations that you will have as human beings. That we have as human beings. That you have as a person. You can only be one place. You can't be everywhere. Whilst the Holy Spirit can be everywhere, you can only be one place. Thank God for you that you're here. And the third limitation we have is that we have limited resources. 
We have limited resources. And so right now in times of crisis, whilst everyone can be busy saying, you know what, this, you know what, where is the church? Why aren't they giving this? And why aren't they giving that? And where are you? Why aren't you giving this? And why are they giving that? And all sorts of groups that are busy collecting donations. Some people might have the resources and extra resources to share and to give with others, but some people don't. Why? Because there's limited resources. And that's the fact. It's a fact. No one has everything. We all have something. We all have something. So these are some of the limitations and, uh, that we have and that we can frustrate us as human beings. That number one, we have limited time. And even though there's so much we want to do, there's a limited time we have. We have the same hours in a day. And no matter how much you want to do or how much you want, you have 24 hours to do what you want to do. And number two, you have, a, you have what, number one, in, when it comes to still to time, you have a single lifetime to do whatever it is you want to do. A single lifetime. And number two, you're a spatial being. So you have to choose where you want to be. It's either you're going to be at the office or you're going to be home. It's, you, you have to choose. You can't be everywhere. And number three, you have limited resources. And you know, as, as leaders, you know, those are the things that they deal with. They deal with the limitations and restrictions and frustrations of being human. And out of those frustrating situations, they have to come up with a solution. And then worst of all, they have people that are busy commenting and busy. And these days, everyone is a reporter. Everyone with an Android or an iPhone, everyone with a phone is like a reporter. Everyone has something to say. So these people who post this on Facebook and this one would put this on Twitter and people who put this on Instagram, the president is doing this wrong and that person is doing it. But what would you do? Regarding even when you, when you begin to consider that as a person, there are limitations. There are time limitations and, and there, there are space limitations and there are resource limitations. And sometimes it can be frustrating to be a human being because we have to deal with all of these frustrations. And so even for me to be sitting here, you know, it, 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 it took time. It took a lot of commitment. But the, what the restrictions teach us, the, the limited time and the limited space and the limited resources teach us, they teach us the importance of priority. They teach us that whilst you can't be everywhere, whilst you can't do everything, you have to then to be selective and you have to learn to prioritize because you don't have to, you don't have you don't have two lifetimes you have one lifetime so you have to be careful about what you choose to do in this lifetime and number two you have to be careful about what you do where you choose to be because you can't be everywhere so you're either watching this broadcast or you're watching tv or you're watching you, you can only be one place maybe if you have five phones you can try to be broadcasting a lot of things but you can only be one place because you're a spatial being and number three, you have limited resources. You can only give, give towards a certain cause. You can only give towards a single direction. You, your resources are limited. And as I began to ponder upon this, I then realized that these are some of the frustrations that Jesus also experienced. These are the same frustrations that we have as human beings are the same frustrations that Jesus had. Jesus had, when he was a human being, he had limited time. He had limited space. He had limited time. There are certain things he could only do at a certain time. He could only do certain things. He had 24 hours. Just like us, he had 24 hours. Number two, he had limited space. He could only be at one place at one time. Number three, he had limited resources. He could only have certain things. Maybe the things that he and his disciples had. He also had the same frustrations that we have in our day-to-day our, our -day lives. So that's why in the first scripture we read in the book of John 4, the Bible says he must... He must, he must pass through Samaria. He must. And what the word must teaches us is that there is priority. It was important. It was a priority. It was a have to. In the middle of everything Jesus had to do in his days on earth, in his 33 years of being alive and as a human being, he must pass through Samaria. And when I read that scripture, something jumped up in me and said, he must, must, must. And as I was praying for the service, the Holy Spirit began to say to me, must, must, must. Share with them that he must, he must, he must. And just as he must, you must. Hey, hey. So because brothers and sisters, you are a limited human being and you have limited time, you have limited resources, you have limited space. There are things that you need to learn. You need to learn the power of priority. You need to learn to prioritize things. You need to learn the importance of, of knowing what is more important than the other because you have limited time. So there are certain things that you need to know that I must do. I must. Hey, yeah, yeah. I must. There are things that you need to understand that they are a must. And then there are things that you need to begin to understand that they are optional. So that is the revelation of John 4 verse 4, that he must pass through Samaria. He must, he must. And just like me and you, there are certain things that we must do. <laughs> we must, we must. They are not an option. They are not a choice. There are things you must do. 
You must do them because you don't have enough time to do everything you want to do. You must do them because you don't have enough resources to do everything you want to do. You must do them because you don't have enough space. <laughs> you have limited, you have limitations. So because you have limitations, you need to learn to prioritize between the things you must and the things that you are that are optional, things that you can choose to do. Uh, if I don't even finish the rest of this message, I think I've preached there. Because we don't understand that in life there are certain things that are a must. So if our Lord and Savior, if Jesus himself, there were things in his 33 years of life, there were things he must do. He must do. Hey, if Pastor Jones was watching this, he would be excited because he's one of the people that I know who loves this scripture. Who, lo- who always says that, and Jesus must pass through Samaria. But I feel like I'm preaching to somebody today and the Lord has been saying to me, share with my people that in this lifetime, they don't have enough time, they think, and they don't have enough resources, they think, and they don't have enough space, they think, but they need to begin to understand there are things that they, there are things that they must. There are things that you must do things that you must do things that you must do even as i'm sitting here every sunday service i mean imagine imagine if you you tune into facebook and then you know there's nothing happening and there's no broadcast and when apostle is supposed to be doing the service and then you ask me tomorrow ah apostle where were you we wanted to join you for sunday service and then i say ah you know what there were other things i was doing i had to do my kids homework and i had to be out on a date with with pastor haru and the, the way thing and then i begin to say that But every Sunday morning, I know there is something that I must. There are things that I must do. If you ask my son, Jojo, he will say, Dad, I would have wanted you to be playing with toys with me. If you ask Star, she will say, Dad, I want you to be telling me stories. If you ask my wife, she will say, I want us to go to Hawaii and to be living it up. But I know, I know that in the middle of all these other things, there is one thing that every Sunday I must do. I must do. And the reason why I must do this is because I'm a limited human being. So I don't have all the time in the world and I don't have all the resources in the world and I don't have all the space in the world and so I can only be at one place at a time. I can only be here with you today. I can only be here doing this service at this time because this is one of those things that I must. Just like you and your place there in your home, there are things that you must do. <laughs> you must. There are certain things that are optional, but there are things that are a must. And the reason why there are certain things that are a must is because those things, you know, people always ask me as a business consultant, they say to me, as a business consultant, what, what, what is the difference between people that are successful and people that are mediocre? What is the difference between super achievers and people that are underachievers? And I say to them, the difference between achievers and underachievers is that people that are achievers know certain things are a must. They know certain things are a must. But people that are underachievers don't know they must. They don't, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. they don't know how to prioritize. They don't know how to identify that certain things are more important than other things. Because they don't know how to prioritize. Years later when they are fired and years later when they lose that job, all of a sudden they begin to, thank you brother Tafasa for joining us. You know, years later they begin to understand that you know what, I think my priorities were messed up. I think my priorities were messed up. So one of the things that I share with my people at church, I always say to them, you need, we were pushing the past two years. If you're a part of our church, I've been pushing the same word. You need to have multiple streams of income. You need to have at least four streams of income. You need, you need to be an investor. You need to be a business partner. You need to be an employee. Then you need to have your own business. You need to have at least four streams of income. And some people didn't understand why I was pushing that agenda. But now in the time of crisis, you would wish you had at least more streams of income because maybe at your job they're telling you we're not giving you that amount of money maybe at your job they're already sending out letters to say you know what we're thinking of firing some people we think we might have to let some people go but we've been preaching the same word that you must have many streams of income because it's not an option it's a it's a must so in our lives there are certain things that are a must there are certain things that are optional and there are certain things that are a must and sometimes we, we don't get to be successful and we don't get to achieve what we want to do with our lives because we don't understand that there are things that are a must. But the Bible just told us in the book of John that Jesus must pass by Samaria. If Jesus had things that he must do, ay, 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 what about you? Hey, what about you? If Jesus, Jesus could do everything, not, ay, 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 Jesus could do everything, but the scripture tells us in the book of of John verse 4, he must pass through Samaria. He must. He must. 
So the Lord began to speak to me and then began to say to me, share with my people that each and every one of them, there are things that I wrote in your book, in the book of life that you must do, that you must do. So I began to understand that on judgment day, judgment day is going to be based on the things that you must do and things that you were optional. <laughs> Judgment day is going to be based on things. When God takes the book of life, he's going to say, do you know what? When I created you, there were things that I wanted you to do. There were things that were a must. Other things were optional. Other things were chosen. Other things you would have chosen to do or not to do. Other things were there. But there were things that I wrote down that were a must. And I'm judging you today because maybe you did not do well on your must. And I'm judging you today because maybe you did well on your must. Brothers and sisters, there is a must in our lives. And may God begin to reveal to you your must. You must, you must do, you must do, you must do, so that by the end of this service, you're going to get up and you say, you know what, I was created for more than this. I was created a, a couple of years ago when I was writing the book, Hungry for Greatness. I was sitting down in my office and I was frustrated. I was sitting down in the office working for a certain company, frustrated and unhappy and pissed off because something inside of me was saying, there are certain things you must do. You should not be sitting here. You should not be sitting here. You are not an employee. You are a man of God. You should be out there sharing the word of God instead of here being used in the eye. Ah, yeah, yeah. And then I began to make a challenge. And then I said, Spirit of God, if there are things that I must do, then give me the grace to get me out of this employment. Give me the grace to get out of this. And I feel like praying for somebody today. You might be stuck in a situation that is hindering you from things that you must do. May God give you the grace just as he gave me the grace to leave employment and to start my own businesses and to become my own entrepreneur and to become my own employer. And now I dictate the times and now I can say to myself, you know what? Now it's time for you to start praying and even in the morning and today I'm not going to work and because there were certain things that were a must do in my life and just like there are certain things that are a must do in your life. I've told my wife for years and She's sitting here and she's the church today. She's the congregation today. I told her in our early years of marriage and, and I said to her, I said, you know what? I am a limited person, amen. I can only be one place and I can only do one thing and I can only I have certain resources that are limited. And so therefore, every morning, my prayer to God is, show me the things that I am must do today. Yeah, 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 yeah. Show me the things that I am must. And I don't want to be caught up in the things that I don't have to do. And if I don't have to wash the dishes, I don't have to. And if I don't have to clean the house, I don't have have to it. If I don't have to do that, I don't have to. But if maybe I have to phone Rutendo and say, Rutendo, God has a word for you. And let me call Rutendo. If I have a word for, for Chico, let me call Chico. And if I have a word for Joy, let me call Joy. If I have a word for someone, because there are certain things every day when I wake up in the morning that I must, that I must do. There are certain things that I must do. And there are certain things that are optional. And the reason why I must do those things is because those things are going to contribute to how God is going to look at me at the end. And those things are going to contribute to what's going to happen to my wife and my kids 10 years from now and 20 years from now and 30 years from now. And because 30 years from now, and my son and my daughter are going to look back and they're going to say, Dad, you are super. Dad, you are awesome. Dad, I didn't know you had all this sorted. Dad, you had all this based on the decisions that I'm doing today. So I had to be serious. I have to be serious. If you're a man, you're watching this. Stop playing games. Amen. Stop playing games. Don't rely on one stream of income. Don't rely on the job. What if they fire you? What's going to happen to your wife and kids? And What's going to happen to your future? Because you put your hands in the power of somebody's hands. Uh, in the power. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are things you must do. Amen. Learn to be an entrepreneur and learn to, into, to start doing other things. Begin to have other streams of income uh, so that when things like this happen, uh, you are safe. You are secured. There's, you are... You are sorted. Oh, I'm getting excited. Oh, I'm getting excited. Because brothers and sisters, the truth of the matter is, there are certain things that I must. Oh, there are certain things that I must. 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 I love one of my brothers in church. I have, I have men of God in church, just to name a few. There are pastors in my church. Every, every month and when their paycheck comes through, they phone me and they say, men of God, I want to bring my offering. I want to bring my tithe because my tithe is a must. Hey, Pastor Carlos, evangelist. Oh, Pastor Ru, Pastor. Hey, Pastor. Pa hey, Pastor TK. When, when, when the money's come through, I must. I must. Among others. I know other people from our church do it because we've put that. It's a must. Brothers and sisters, there are certain things that are a must. They are not an option. They are a must. And the same word for must is the same word Jesus uses when he's talking about the script, about the law, about the Ten Commandments. When you read the scriptures, Jesus says that doesn't the law say you must obey your father and you must. 
Because there are certain things that take priority. There are certain things that are more important than others. And because you know you're a limited being, you need to quickly identify your must. I pray for you today where you are, that may God begin to reveal to you your must. May God begin to reveal to you your must. Things that will change your life in this lifetime. Decisions that you begin to make, that if you begin to make them in this lifetime, your life, your life here on earth will change. And your life in the afterlife in heaven will change. May God begin to reveal to you things that are optional. Things that if you don't do, the world will not stop. If you don't do, you will not go to hell. If you don't do, you will not suffer from birth. If you don't, things that are certain that are optional. May God begin to reveal to you the things that are a must. That are a key to your success. That are a key to your prosperity. And that are a key to your destiny. In the name of Jesus, may he begin to reveal that. Because that is what the first scripture teaches us. Jesus must. Pass through Samaria. Ah, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. And so I began to do more research. I began to do more research on John 4. And then I began to say, what was important? What was so important about Samaria? Because when, whenever the Bible uses the word must, it means that what you're about to read, there's an apparent revelation. There's something that you can see that is in black and white. But there are other things behind the scenes. It means that there is a mystery. It means that there is a mystery. I feel like this message is taking another course altogether. It means that there is a mystery. There is a mystery. You must do it because it's not as it appears. So when you are reading John 4, it looks like Jesus is talking to the woman, to the Samaritan woman. It like, looks like he's talking to her. It looks like he's dealing with her case. It looks like he's dealing with her issues of, of, of husbands, infidelity, whatever it is that you may want to call it. It looks like it. Because the Bible says he goes, he must pass by Samaria. When he goes to Samaria, he sits at the well. Then a woman comes to draw water from the well. And he, be, he begins and he begins to converse with her. He begins to talk to her. And for years, I've been focusing on the conversations with that woman. And this is one of the key scriptures that I use in the book, Kingdom Prophets. You need to get a copy of the book, the Kingdom Prophets, of how he prophesied. Because I thought, I thought, number one, the first thing Jesus was doing was that he was ministering to that woman. And the second thing that I thought that I show up here in this book is that he was teaching us the secret of the prophetic process of how you prophesy. Because how Jesus prophesies to this woman is different to how he prophesies to every other person. He shows the prophetic process in this. So I've been limiting it to the prophetic process. But yesterday as I was preparing for service, the Holy Spirit then began to say to me, no, yes, that one is a deeper revelation. But there is something else why you must pass through Samaria. And then I began to do more research between what was happening. So there is something that the Samaritan woman says, the Samaria woman says, she says to Jesus, why, who are, why are you as a Jew talking to me as a Samaritan? Because we have no dealings with each other. Because we have no dealings with each other. And then the Lord began to open my eyes. And then he began to say to me, that's it right there. That, that's why he must pass through Samaria. Because there was generation of things. So as I did more research, I began to realize that for generations, the Samaritans have issues with the Jews. And the Jews had issues with the Samaritans. So there was a tribalism problem going on. There was a generational problem that Jesus needed to address. There was a generational issue. The Samaritans were saying that we need to worship there in the this other mountain and then the Jews were saying that if you're worshiping you need to worship in Jerusalem you need to worship in this other place and so there were issues there were generational issues so the Lord began to say to me the reason why Jesus had to go to Samaria was because there were generational issues that needed to be addressed and then secondly if you read closely if you read remember when you were reading the scripture the Bible says that Jesus went to Samaria in a place called Sychar where Jacob gave Joseph his son a piece of land so it was a place of generationalism and if, let me take it a bit further. A well in the things of the prophetic, it resembles prophetic blessings, generational blessings, because it's something that is transferred between generations. So there were three generational things that are being addressed there. Number one, the generational issues between the Jews and the Samaritans. Number two, this is the place where Jacob gave his son Joseph a piece of land. Number three, there is a well that has been used for generations. So the Lord began to share with me that there is a generational issue being addressed here. This is an issue of generational issues. And then I began to say to me, minister to me, Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit began to say to me, the Samaritans had issues with the Jews. And this issue was going on for generations. Just like some of us here, you're watching this. You're dealing with generational issues. You're dealing with generational issues. The same things that have been happening with you for generations. That Jesus needs to address in this service. So what I found interesting was this. Before... 
When Jesus is speaking to this woman and he begins to minister to her, she has had five husbands. She is one of those people that in this day and age, you might call a small house if you are polite. You might call her a prostitute if you are harsh. You can give her all sorts of names because she was of those things. She had been messing around with all sorts of men. But after Jesus ministered to her, she is the one who evangelized to the whole city of Samaria. So inside of a small house was the great, was an evangelist. Inside what you would call a prostitute Judah was a woman of God inside, but there were generational issues that were limiting her to her past, that were limiting her to a generational limitations, that were limiting her to generational issues, and they were stopping her destiny because inside of a woman of at the well was an evangelist, an evangelist who, after she had an encounter with Jesus, she began to go to her brothers and sisters, she began to go to the city, she went to the whole city, and she began to say to them, You know what? I have seen the Messiah, and the Bible says the whole city was saved because of a small house who was an evangelist in the spirit. But when Jesus addressed the generational problems, the evangelist was born. The woman of God was born. There's somebody I'm preaching to today. There's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. There is so much greatness in you. Oh, I feel like I'm preaching to somebody. There are so much in you, but there are certain generational issues that are keeping you stuck as a certain person. But even, yeah, 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 yeah. So even though there is so much greatness, there's a woman of God in you. There's a man of God in you. There's a businessman in you. There's a millionaire in you. But there are generational issues that have been hindering your progress. There are generational issues that are hindering your destiny. There are generational things that are hindering you. Just like Jesus was speaking to this woman at the well, and it seems like he's talking Talking about her current situation, but he was unlocking the woman of God. He was unlocking the evangelist. And I, I feel like somebody is getting this. He was, I, hey, 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 hey. He, it's not about the woman. It's about generational issues being addressed. It's about generational issues. So I began to say to the Lord, why generational issues? And then he began to say to me, because you are a limited human being, you need generational blessings. Because you are a limited human being, there are certain things that if you're going to achieve, you need generational blessings. You need generational breakthroughs. and You need generational impartation. Because you can't do it in a single lifetime. You can't do it with your own resources. You can't do it because you're limited to time, space, and matter. You're limited to the things that you have. You are limited. So you need a generational blessing. So you're ta- there's a generational deficit that can hinder your destiny. There are generational. There are people that are busy paying for generational transgressions that their parents did and that their great great parents did, and they are hindering your progress because success and ah, yeah, yeah. So those things are affected by what our forefathers did. And sometimes our forefathers not going to They might have done things that are hindering the man of God in me, hindering the woman of God in my wife. So in Jesus' name, as Jesus addressed this woman of Samaria, may He address your situation. That any generational things that are, yeah, 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 that are limiting the woman of God in you, may they be addressed. Any generational limitations that are limiting the man of God in you, may they be addressed. Any generational issues that are affecting your businesses, affecting your job, and affecting your money, and affecting your present situation, and affecting your future, may they be addressed in this service so that you can begin to, uh, to access generational blessings. To access generational blessings because there are certain things that I can't do in a single lifetime. I don't know how big your vision is, but my vision is big, amen. I may not be able to do it in a single lifetime, amen. We might need to combine lifetimes, amen. So that's why the Bible purposely says in the book of John that this is the place that Jacob gave his son Joseph a piece of land. This is the place that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Read it again, I'm telling you. Jacob gave his son Joseph a piece of land in that same city of Samaria. In that same city. And Jesus, Jesus later on goes on to say in the later scriptures uh, that this is the season uh, in which the reaper, the sower, and the reaper are going to harvest. Uh, the sower, Jesus says this in the, late, in the same chapter of John 4. Uh, he says that one is going to sow uh, and the other is going to reap. Uh, because the truth of the matter, brothers and sisters, is there are certain things we want to do in our lives. Uh, but someone needs to have sown them. Uh, and someone needs to be a reaper. Maybe we're supposed to be reapers. Uh, but there needs to be some sowing. And the devil wants to lie to us that our forefathers were all into witchcraft. That is a liar. Some of them were good people and some of them were great people and some of them did mighty things and some of them were rich and some of them were wealthy. And today, I choose to tap into their destinies. I choose to tap into the things that they did. And I say, in the name of Jesus, may I begin to receive generational blessing, big data generational 
blessings, uh, things that they did uh, that were lost in the middle of generations. May I begin to receive. Uh, and even if maybe, maybe, maybe perchance, uh, my generation passed, uh, they did not have blessings. Uh, but in the spirit, uh, there is generation of blessings. Uh, because you are now a child of God. Uh, there are generational things that you must benefit from. Uh, and that's why Jesus said to go through certain things. Uh, because he knew it. Uh, that we can't do it in a single lifetime. Uh, because he knew it. Uh, because we can't do it with our capacity. Uh, we can't do it with the resources we have. Uh, and so he said uh, there are things uh, that I must go through uh, so that they won't need to go through it. I must uh, so that they benefit. I must uh, so that they get the benefit. I must uh, so that they profit. I must uh, so that they increase. Uh, so in the second scripture we read uh, the bible says uh, jesus must go through jerusalem uh, and he must suffer he must die and he must go through death and he must resurrect on the seventh day uh, he must go through those things uh, because maybe i'm not supposed to go through those things uh, he must be poor so that i can be rich uh, he must be sick uh, so that i can be well uh, he must go through that uh, so that i don't need to go through this uh, because the vision i have cannot be done in a single lifetime it needs multiple lifetimes i am praying for someone with a billion dollar idea. I am praying for someone with a global ministry. I'm praying for someone who should be walking on water. Somebody who should be healing the sick. But you are stuck in generational problems. Those things are being addressed in this ministry. May you get out of your seat as a woman of God. May you get out of your chair as a man of God. Because generational things have been generational things have been resolved. 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 So this is why Jesus must. This is why Jesus must. This is why Jesus must go through Samaria. Because he understood that they are by. And if you didn't know it, there are the generational things that Jesus was dealing with. He was dealing with the issue of Gentiles and Jews. Because the Samaritans were considered as Gentiles. But then... <laughs> salvation was only supposed to be for the Jews. So this is one of the first times that Jesus begins to minister to Gentiles. If you don't know what a Gentile is, you are a Gentile. I am a Gentile. A Gentile is anyone who's not a Jew. And in originally, initially, the, 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 the salvation was only for Jews. But this is the first woman who was a Gentile that Jesus began to minister to as a sign to us that you might not be a Jew, but you have access to this inheritance. You might not be a Jew, but you have access to salvation. You might not be a Jew. And there's a lot of good things I've heard about Jews. I have heard that Jews have money. I've heard that Jews pass on blessings to their children. I am passing on things to my son. And I'm passing on things to my daughter. And I'm passing on things to my wife. Because I have access to the things that the Jew have. Oh, in Jesus' name. Because Jesus addressed these things. Jesus addressed these things. At a well that resembles generational wealth. At a well that resembles generational prosperity. Because a well goes through generations. And generations continue to take. After hundreds of years. After Jacob had had an encounter with God. And then he built that well. This woman was still taking water from that well. She was still taking water from that well. Because there are things that need generational grace. And generational blessing. Oh, I feel like it. Hey, 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 hey. Hey, hey. Oh, this is the word for someone. This is the word for someone. We've been sharing in our church group. And I've been saying that we need a television network. We need a television network. We need Kingdom Nation TV. And now our TV network needs to be different. Our TV network is not going to be about apostle preaching every Sunday. No. It needs to be a channel that is cooking people. That is motivational people. That is shows. Pastor Roo needs to have a show talking to the ladies. There needs to be shows about men. And there needs to be cartoons for kids. And it needs to be a holistic network. There needs to be cooking shows. I feel like I'm preaching to somebody who needs to start a cooking show. There needs to be a motivational show. I feel like I'm talking to Sister Priscilla. You need to sit down and start talking some stuff about Priscilla. About motivation. There needs to be talk about business. I feel like I'm talking to evangelist. I think I'm talking to Brother Nyasha. You need to start shows. I'm saying, and as I was talking about the budget, the millions of dollars that I needed, the billions of dollars that I needed, the Holy Spirit began to say to me, there are certain things that need a generational blessing. But don't worry. Don't worry. You are a child of God. There are things Jesus must go through so that you don't have to go through. There are things Jesus had to go through that you are not going to go through. 
So begin to claim the spiritual generation of blessings so that you can begin to count the limitations of time so that in 24 hours you're going to do more than what other people can do so that you will have generational blessing to override the limitation of space so that even though you can be at one place at a time, millions of people can see you online so that you can begin to pronounce generational blessings to offer resources that even though you can limit your money to what your business is bringing in to what somebody is paying you as a salary you're going to begin to access monies that other people have and people are going to start giving to your bosoms left right and center hey, hey, hey. so we are beginning to have those things because the vision I have is bigger and I'm praying for you if you can do it with your own money your vision is smaller if you can do it in your own time then your vision is smaller and if you can do it in your own power your vision is smaller but if you're like me if you have an elephant of the vision then you need generational blessing you need generational things you need generational capacity you need somebody to have gone before you and you need to claim what they did there is no harm in you claiming what somebody else did there is no harm in that because it's a relay <laughs> it's a relay and I'm saying to Jesus Pass on the button to me. Pass on those monies to me. Pass on that power to me. Pass on it to me. Because I can continue where you left off. Just like you. Take the button. Take over from where you left off. Take over from where you left off. In your own capacity. In your own vision. Because at the end of the world, when you die, God is going to judge you based on things that you must God is going to judge you based on things you must do. Based on things you must do. Not everything. Based on things you must do. But some of these things, we can't do it. Brothers and sisters, we can't do it. We can't do it in our own strength. We can't do it in our own might. We can't do it. We can't do it in a single lifetime. We can't do it. We need multiple lifetimes. One of the most dangerous scriptures is the scripture in the book of Kings. The Bible says that when, when Elisha died, they buried his bones. And after he, his bones were dried up, there was a certain soldier who had died. And then they brought that dead soldier and they threw him on the bones of Elisha. And the Bible says, the dead bones of the prophet rose the man of God, rose the soldier back to life. The dead bones, the dead bones of prophet Elisha raised a soldier back to life. In other words, the Elisha had the resurrection power. But he died with it. The prophet Elisha had the anointing of resurrection. But he failed to pass on the baton. So he died with the anointing. He died with it. There are so many men and women of God that have died with the anointing. In the mighty name of Jesus. <laughs> if we are, yeah, yeah, yeah. The book of Hebrews talks that says that we have clouds of witnesses. We have clouds of witnesses. In other words, those things that Samson did, those things that Moses did, those things, we have the grace to make a demand in the realm of the spirit. And we say, if we are the children of Papa Abraham, <laughs> we claim that generational blessing. We claim that generational blessing that may begin to manifest. So when Jesus ministered to that woman, when Jesus ministered to that woman at the well, when the moment he addressed generational issues, that woman changed from being a small house, from being a prostitute, from being a player, from being whatever you want to call her, from being a core girl, to being an evangelist, to being an evangelist, to being an evangelist, to being an evangelist, to being an evangelist. Oh, I need to keep saying this because somebody needs to get it. To being an evangelist. Because she, right there and then, she received Generational grace. Generational grace. Generational grace. Generational grace. Generational grace. And my prayer was, God, give me generational grace. I can do it. I can do it in my years of lifetime. If I live to 120 years, the things that you've called me to do, I cannot even do them in 120 years. I can't. I can't. I'm going to live to over 100, but I still can't do it in over 100 years. I need 200 years. I need 300 years. I need 400 years. I need more years. And I need you, Lord, to begin to release that grace. Because I can't do it in my lifetime. So begin to take lifetimes of Papa Abraham. Begin to take lifetimes 
of Moses. Begin to take lifetimes of Jacob. Begin to take all these things and begin to bring that grace to me so that I can be able to do more in a single lifetime. In the mighty name of Jesus, that's my prayer for you. That's my prayer. 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 That not just for me, but for my wife sitting over there. My wife sitting over there. The things that she has to do, they cannot be done in a single lifetime. We pray for generational blessing. That's the same thing for my kids, Star and Churchill. The things that they, they, they need to do, that they must do, cannot be done in a single, gener- single lifetime. And even their kids, they need generational blessing. And that's the same thing. I pray for you. I pray for your marriages. I pray for your kids. I pray for your families. You can't do it in your single lifetime. You can't. You need generational blessing. You need generational and maybe your, 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 your blood lineage may not have those blessings, but your spiritual lineage has it. And you are a child of Papa Abraham. You are, you, you are cousins and, and you have spiritual cousins and relatives that are prophets and prophetesses written in the Bible. Amen. They are written in the Bible. They are written in the Bible. Now it's time for us to begin to say, God, in the name of Jesus, we claim every generational blessing. And as you address this generational blessing with this woman at the well, Address those generational issues in our lives. Address generational issues in our lives. We want to begin to do things that cannot be done in a single generation. Things that cannot be done in a single lifetime. Things that cannot be done in a single individual. May those things begin to be done in us. Because there are things that you wrote in the book of life and you said, Farai must. He must do these things. But Farai is saying back to you, I can't do it in this single lifetime. I can't do it with these human limitations. I can't. I can't do it. I can't do it when right now schools are closed and I need to do homework with my son and my daughter. I can't do it when, when in the middle of all that is happening, I need to help my wife with the work in the house. I can't do it. There's so much more that needs to be done. But if you release a generation of grace, I can do it. If you release generational blessing in my life, I can do it. Because some of the things that I'm doing today, they are not a priority. Some of the things I'm doing today, they are not an option. Some of those things that I'm doing today, they should be optional. So that I should focus on the things I must do. I pray for every person who's a part of our church. I pray for every person who's listening to this message today. That may you deliver them from generational limitations. And may you deliver them from human limitations. And may they begin to receive generational breakthroughs. Generational blessings. Generational grace. So that their limitations are broken. And they can be able to do more. They can be able to do more. They can be able to do more. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Receive it where you are. Amen. Receive it where you are. Receive it where you are. There's a song that we've been taught to sing in our church. It goes, Abraham's blessings are mine. Abraham's blessings are mine. Abraham's blessings are mine. And you know, we, we, we sing it when it's, when it's during offering time. But today, it, from now on as I sing it, I'm not going to sing it because it's offering time, because I have to give to receive the blessings. No. From today forward, when you, re- when you sing that song, if you know it, sing it with the understanding that whether you are tither or not, there are certain generational blessings that are yours. There are certain generational blessings that are yours. And you need them. Jesus must go through. Abraham must go through certain things so that you receive the blessings. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you for taking your time to watch this broadcast. I believe it's been a blessing to you. And I don't want it to be a blessing in which, you know, you, you're going to then say, oh my gosh, it was powerful, it was powerful. No. I want you to be like that woman at the well. I want from this moment for you to get up and begin to claim generational blessing and to begin to move on a generational blessing. That someone, I don't care where you're from, I don't care what you've done. You may have done witchcraft. You may have been a prostitute. You may have done some shame, shameful things. You may, no one cares. This woman at the well had done some horrible things. Jesus even said, the man that you're with today is not your husband. Implying that maybe she was with another man's husband, with another woman's husband. Amen. But the moment she got off that well, she was a woman of God. The moment she got off that well, she was an evangelist. And she began to do those things. The must do's. May you get off your seat today and may you begin to receive revelation of the things you must do and may you begin to do them. Don't care what people say. Don't care. Don't care. It doesn't matter what they think. 
It doesn't matter what they say. What matters is at the end of the world, on judgment day, God is going to be holding a book like this, a diary like this, and it's going to have your name on it. And he's going to say, when I created you, there were things that I wanted you to do. They were a must do. How far did you do those things? Those are the things I'm praying that you must do. May you receive the grace to do those things. And after a couple of days, may you begin to send me videos or pictures or testimonies to say, man of God, I've received the grace. I'm now doing those things. I've received the grace. I'm not doing those things. Thank you, everyone. Once again, you know, in closing, you know, if you, if you have never, if you're not, if you have never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you're not saved and you're not born again, for you to receive this generation of blessings we're talking about, you need to be saved. You know, we might not be able to do this online, but it's inbox, inbox me, inbox the church on, after the service and say, you know what, I need to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And we will contact you briefly after the service and we'll walk you through the sinner's prayer, the repentance prayer, so that you receive salvation and you receive this generation of blessings. And we never want to close off a service without giving you an opportunity to give. For us to be streaming this, it takes resources. It's a must. We must buy, we must pay data. Amen. <laughs> we must have resources. You know, and if the Lord is speaking to you and saying, you know what, I need to bring an offering. Right now, last week we got up, we received offering from, from Brother Marcus and Sister Chico and others, and then we gave to the poor. Today, if you feel like you know what you want to give, you know, send a message, send an inbox after and say, you know what, men of God, I want to give towards this ministry, I want to give towards this broadcast. We are bigger than this, we are better than this. If you want to give, just send an inbox, and then we can ma make an arrangement for your offering and for your tithes and whatever you want to give. But otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day, enjoy the rest of your week, enjoy the rest of the month, enjoy the rest of the year. So you might be asking, why was it called the corona effect? These things must happen in why the corona effect. I, the message was supposed to be called the corona effect because there are certain things that the coronavirus has forced us to realize. And, and you know, right now governments are talking about essential services and essential goods. The coronavirus has, has provoked us to begin to prioritize between the musts and the optional. <laughs> between the musts and the optional. The coronavirus. And this is what I call the corona effect. The revelation of priority. And if human beings, people that are not believers, can get to a place in which they can say, you know what? There are certain things that are more important than others. Football, we love you. Messi, we love you. Ronaldo, we love you. But go home. We don't need you. Doctors, you are the heroes of the day. The coronavirus. As believers, as, 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 as brothers and sisters in the faith, we don't need the corona effect. The world needs the corona effect to realize the importance and priorities. As brothers and sisters, we don't need the coronavirus to realize three things. Realize, number one, the end of the world is near. To realize that, number one, you can die. You can die. You can die anytime. To realize, number three, that the world can change in a moment. You don't need the coronavirus. If you're, if you're a child of God, you don't need the coronavirus to teach you these things. You are supposed to be already in the corona effect. Each and every day of your life, you need to always know that, you know what? If I die today and have a meeting with God, I am not scared. I will say, you know what? I used to do live streaming on Facebook. You know what? I started a cooking show, Rutendo. I started a cooking show. I started doing this and I was using that cooking show to share the word of God. And I was saying to people, you know what? The Bible says, you know, we are the salt of the earth. Here I am sprinkling some salt on this food. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know whatever ministry the Lord wants you to do. Plaques, I don't know what the Lord wants you to do. But we don't need the corona effect to teach us priority. But the coronavirus has is, is, is forced us to confront priorities. So that's why the title was called Slash the Corona Effect. But in this, in this effect, the things, there are three things that I know I just want to share in closing. I might not be able to share them next time. The Lord was saying to me, number one, the Corona Effect also is a revelation that the end times must come, that they're near. It's a trigger of the end times. Brothers and sisters, we're now living in the end times. Whether you like it or not, whether what, it's a sign of the end times. It's a sign of the end times. Let's begin to live every day like it's the last. Let's begin to prepare for the end of the world. Number two, the Lord was saying to me, I'm releasing an end time grace. An end time grace. In the last days. A last days grace. So wherever you are, wherever you are, if you want, you can receive the end time grace. To do for much more, so much more in so much little time. And then number three, the Lord was saying to me, if you're a Christian, the coronavirus is supposed to teach you the importance of essential goods and services. Each and every one of us, we need to start a business that's involved in essential goods and services. Because one day, one day, one day, 
those things might be important. Because right now the corona has already shown us that these, these services and these jobs are more important than other jobs. These services are more important than other services. These goods are more important than these other goods. So each and every one of you, if you're going to do a business, begin to do a business, download the essential services uh, outline and begin to use that as a business outline to say, you know what? I'm going to start a business. I'm going to do it. Me and my wife are going to sit down. We're going to start a, start a business in the essential goods and services so that one day, if there's another virus, so that one day, if the worst comes to the worst, we, we are involved in the essential services group. Let's stop spectating. Stop watching as things are happening. Begin to say, you know what, God? I've cried enough. I've wept enough. I've washed enough. Now it's time for me to get involved. So that if such a thing is ever to happen again, I am sorted. In the name of Jesus, I pray for you. Amen. Thank you for taking your time out. We appreciate you taking your time to join us in these services. It's always a pleasure. I'm always excited to share the word of God with you. I'm excited about the things God is doing in my life. Kingdom Nation TV is coming and other projects also. I'm excited about the things God is doing in my wife, in my kids. And I'm excited about the things that God is doing in your life. Now we want the, 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 the testimonies to come in. Amen. Bye-bye. For content like this and more, please visit kingdomnation.org or any of our social media pages. Be blessed.